Remember when watching Real Friends MTV that the world doesn't know that these guys aren't all friends or don't all live in WeHo. It is opening doors for the Real Friends of any city to be produced. This is gay representation in living rooms around the world. Bring on back 90 minute episodes of RuPaul's Drag Race and not air the real friends Damn, of We Hope. I wish these social justice warriors would set their sights on actual issues. They're so passionate that we'd have free health care, free college, a green planet, no world hunger or homelessness, and world peace. Oh, wait, they mainly get butt hurt over the scheduling of reality TV shows. Ivy Quote tweets a bait QT about the real friends of WeHo which has a thread of comments filled with very graphic scat porn and NSLF content. For those out of the loop, season 15 of RuPaul's Drag Race School for Girls just started airing like two weeks ago. For the last few years, the mainstay US seasons have been airing on VH1, which falls under the umbrella of Paramount, formerly known as Viacom. When season 15's cast was revealed, it was also announced that Drag Race would be airing on MTV instead of VH1. MTV is owned by the same conglomerate, and some people thought that this was a sign that Drag Race was being taken more seriously as a property because MTV meant an inherently larger audience. Although at this point, I would argue that the difference in audiences between both channels is negligible because MTV is currently being used as a graveyard where ridiculousness goes to die. I was a little apprehensive about this announcement at first because I don't trust MTV to make good business decisions as evidenced by the fact that they have hundreds of once beloved and useful properties now just collecting dust in a fucking vault. But even I wasn't prepared for the online shitstorm that was coming their way. You see, it was announced that Drag Race's premiere would come with an all new programming calendar for Friday nights. Drag Race would be airing from 8 to 9 p.m., Untucked would be airing at 10, which meant that something would have had to go in between. This isn't the first time they've done this. If you remember back around season 12, Secret Celebrity Drag Race was aired in that time slot. But this time, MTV announced that this slot would be occupied by a brand new show called The Real Friends of WeHo. Now, to make matters even worse, it wasn't just that this new show would be wedged in between the main episode and Untucked. It was also revealed that Drag Race, which has been airing 90-minute episodes since season 10, would now be cut down to 42-minute episodes with commercials. This, on top of the fact that this season was touted as having the biggest cast ever with 16 queens, left a lot of people, including myself, asking questions. Mainly, who the fuck thought that this would be a good idea? You may remember that when this all first broke, there was a Deadline article floating around explaining that MTV was trying to create a gay destination television night using Drag Race, an insanely popular franchise, as a springboard to do so. Here's the problem, that's not how TV works anymore. Back when everyone had cable, it was more common for networks to build programs programming blocks to have a sense of familiarity so families at home knew what to expect and would keep coming back. The most legacied example of this that I can think of is World News Tonight, Jeopardy, and then Wheel of Fortune. But that's not how the current model of television really works anymore because cable is becoming a less useful medium for programming. I still have cable, but a lot of people I know who watch Drag Race are doing so with the help of their parents' cable login or just straight up piracy, which I'm not saying we support, but you know, who among us has not visited the bay from time to time? The way Drag Race is distributed is the most convoluted bullshit in the world, with the mainstay US seasons airing on cable, all-star seasons airing on streaming, and anything international airing on WoW Presents Plus. It really is a stupid system. But fans of the show will bend over backwards to watch it because they like the show, not because they have any allegiance to any particular channel or brand or viewing habits. It's literally just because they want to watch this one specific product. The idea of building a gay destination night for MTV totally misunderstands Drag Race's audience and also just gets so much wrong about where the market of TV is headed today. So ultimately, as a concept, this all sounds pretty misguided and bad, but how does it work in practice? Here's the thing, I'm well aware that Drag Race used to be 42 minute episodes regularly and no one died or lost a limb. It was fine. I even understand the criticism that when episodes were 90 minutes, it got pretty boring and fillery once a lot of queens started getting eliminated. I don't understand criticisms like this because they make no sense, but let's move on. Here's where they really fucked up in my opinion. The premiere of Drag Race was 
two hours long, which makes sense because they really wanted a big marketing push and they wanted to bring in as much of an audience as possible. It also made sense because there were 16 queens in it, all doing individual performances and that is a lot to manage. However, I guarantee that if the episodes had all been 42 minutes each from the jump, nobody would have noticed quite as much. Sure, the super fans would have had something to complain about, but what they did is the equivalent of waving a piece of candy in front of a baby for two hours and then taking it away. You're literally showing the audience what they could have had and then giving them something else entirely different that they did not want. And that unhinged rage has to be channeled somewhere, so the more this show was getting promoted leading up to its premiere, the more people wanted their voices to be heard. Not only was a change.org petition created with thousands of signatures asking to bring the old episode format back, but some vigilante freaks started posting scat porn in the mentions of all of the WeHo accounts tweets. That rage, whether entirely justified or not, is being directed at the real friends of WeHo regardless of whether or not it is actually a quality show. And it is not good, but let's talk about why it exists. The Real Gaze of WeHo is an obvious take on the Real Housewives series. The Housewives have been a long-standing cultural institution for decades now, for better or worse. If you're unfamiliar, each Real Housewives series follows the life and times of rich and wealthy socialite women and their families. Throughout the show, there is manufactured drama with the other members of the cast. Oh, here's the thing about Housewives. You might be surprised to know that it actually has a pretty universal appeal. I used to watch it. I haven't watched it in like probably like 10 years at this point, but I even used to be really into New Jersey, the old Atlanta seasons, and it really does have a universal fan base. I know a lot of women who watch it. I know a lot of gay men who watch it. I know a lot of straight men who watch it. And the thing about it is that like, if you take it for what it is, it is mindless, vapid, garbage entertainment, and it's fun. And Housewives has done a good job like occupying that space, not to say that there aren't other shows that have tried to occupy it and have done it somewhat well, but it is really hard to replicate since Housewives is such a strong brand. And MTV has handled these quirky ensemble drama-filled shows before. Jersey Shore was a huge hit and still holds up in a sort of mindless entertainment type way. But with both Housewives and Jersey Shore, all of it was somewhat believable. Even if you know these cast members didn't all know each other before filming and some conflicts had to be instigated by producers, they did a good job of making it engaging enough to suspend your disbelief. With The Real Friends of WeHo, they absolutely didn't do a good job of that. Even in the promotional material, you can tell that these guys had nothing to do with each other before they were cast on this monstrosity. This is even more confirmed by the fact that some other WeHo gays have come out saying that they were approached for this and then they passed it up. And one cast member, Chris Salvatore, who was allegedly hired and fired by production after other cast members allegedly refused to work with him because he had an OnlyPans. Allegedly. Okay, so let's talk about the first episode of the show. We start off with a Selling Sunset-esque remix of Semi-Charmed Life by Third Eye Blind, paired with narration from some of the cast members, and then it transitions into another remix of Everybody Wants to Rule the World by Tears for Fears, which, um... Okay. From there, we are introduced to Brad, who along with Todrick are the only two cast members that anybody sort of knows. Brad has a little chat with his husband about turkey chili or something, and that's intercut with an interview of him talking about why he signed up to do this show, which I think is an interesting choice. So they do these sort of like little vignettes of each of the cast members talking about themselves and what their deal is, and that's like intercut with a scene of them living their lives. But what's a weird choice to me is that a lot of them are all talking about like why they decided to do the show and why they decided to be on the show and when you watch something like the housewives that's never really necessarily part of the narrative because the implication there is that they are going to be on the show because they like attention and they're pretty and dramatic like that's what they're there for so the show is already trying to be like a little bit self-aware and that's just not a good choice because like I said, you're already underselling the fact that the drama here isn't going to be believable because these random people who were cast on this show don't actually know each other. So they're talking about that. They're talking about how they're cast members on a show. And then at one point, like Brad goes to Todrick's house and they have a conversation about nothing. And that scene is only clearly there because they're the only two cast members that anybody actually knows. So it's like, all right, let's have them interact, despite the fact that they don't actually have anything to interact about. Like, you're not actually 
selling me on any of the relationships in these shows. It's just kind of like they all move from point A to point B and are self-aware of the fact that they are performing with each other. There's nothing about it that feels like engaging and nothing to, there's nothing to latch onto. Brad also mentions that he is wary of Todrick, as is the rest of the gay population at this point due to allegations that he doesn't pay his dancers, he doesn't pay rent or something. He's also just known for being annoying whenever he's judging on Drag Race. The show very badly wants for Todrick to be the villain of the whole project, even going as far as to put this graphic up, which I managed to take a picture of, thank god, with like little comments about the casting of the show and like, oh no, why is Todrick on? I love Brad, but why Todrick? Todrick and like, yeah, you guys are almost at the point of being fully self-aware. Keep going. You'll get there eventually. Then we get into all of the other characters that we know less. Curtis is an actor, Dorian is an entrepreneur, James is an entertainment host, and I think he's like the husband of somebody else who is more famous than him, and Joey is an influencer who is like the fun party guy, I guess. Chris and Dorian are okay, you know, they have a nice conversation about what it means to be black and queer, and I'm not here to shit on that, obviously, and I can't personally speak to that experience. The other guy, James, like, there's really not much to him at all, and Joey was really off-putting from the jump for me because his whole thing is that he's an influencer, and when they introduce him, he talks about about how he used to be fat and now he's not. But don't worry guys, sometimes he still gets insecure. Fuck. Then we learn that Joey is having an engagement party for him and his fiance, which gives us our first excuse for all of these people to finally be in the same place at the same time. And our first drama surprisingly doesn't even have Todrick in it. It's between Dorian and Joey. Dorian thinks that Joey is a fraud because he's an influencer with no job. For some reason, he still goes to his engagement party anyway, even though he doesn't like him. Joey confronts him about being like antisocial or something, and then the two of them fight about basically nothing and then there's a to be continued. So yeah, the show has all the problems you think it would have. It's vapid, it's boring, the drama is manufactured and not in a fun way, its existence comes at the expense of a show that everyone actually likes, and because of what I'd like to deem the politics of representation, there are people insisting that there is a moral quandary with being critical of it, and that is fucking stupid. Okay, let's talk about the representation politics trash fire for a second. The cast members of this show have naturally gone on the defense since they've received this amount of backlash and their first argument has been that this isn't their fault. This isn't their fault that this show is airing the way it is at the expense of Drag Race and I agree. That is not their fault. If you're faulting them for that specifically, that is not who you should be directing that anger towards. You should be directing that anger toward MTV because ultimately they are the people who made that decision valid. The other thing that I've seen these cast members say though is that, you know, people who are criticizing the show, the existence of the show, should shut the fuck up because it's gay people on TV and that is a win for all of us. And it's not. That's a really bad and simplified way to look at things because, you know, we went from a time where there was no gay people on TV to Lots more gay people on TV. Those portrayals have been in some ways great, in some ways problematic. It's all getting better, it's all evolving. But when you set that bar and you say that the bar is that, you know, what are you complaining about? There's gay people on TV. That is insulting to the people who are watching your show because then you're therefore saying that because this is a marginalized community, they don't deserve good stories and good programming to be catered to them. And you know what is an example of good story and good programming and and a show that made a very large difference in the queer community? RuPaul's Drag Race. Okay, I wanna bring one more thing up in regards to this topic. Uh, I saw this tweet on Pop Crave. It's attributed to Todrick. I can't find where he said it like the source of where he said it, not great journalistic integrity on my part. However, if this is what he said, I think it's important to address and also I've seen similar sentiment in regards to comparisons to the housewives. So, it says, I want the queer community to have a conversation about why it is that we will praise women when they are in a similar position. I hope our show will break that mold and create a conversation about why there is negativity from within our own community. Okay, so that is in clear 
I think, comparison to the fact that this is based on Housewives. I mean, it is. It's called The Real Friends of WeHo versus The Real Housewives of New York or something. And I've seen that sentiment portrayed from the cast and other people like loosely associated with this show that it's like, oh, well, you don't like it because it's, it's, it's gay men. That's not, that's not why. The Housewives isn't for everyone, but it is for most people. They do what they do and they do it well. And to reduce it down to why are we uplifting these women and not these gay men is not the hot take that you think it is. I agree. Every marginalized group of people needs to be uplifted and represented in some form or fashion. However, you are directing this specific comment and other comments of that same sentiment of like, oh, will the housewives get away with it? You are directing that to one particular community and it is the community that is mad at you. And it is the fans of RuPaul's Drag Race who are mad that you are taking up this space. And speaking as a woman who is a fan of this show, who is active in the community, and you know, there are other women who have been on this show, who have been associated with this show. A lot of us don't feel welcome. We don't, that's just the reality of the situation. There is a, I think, a mentality that this is still a show and a space for certain people and certain people only. And for people to take the route of, well, you like this show when we did it with women and not with gay men, it, it's, it's not it. It's not it. Um, your show isn't groundbreaking. Your show is shit. Thanks for watching whatever the hell this was. If you disagree, that's cool. Leave me alone. Remember to follow me here, here, and here. And thank you as always for watching and I'll see you next time.